Okay. We uh, we have exciting guest today, uh, Marco Hutter, is a professor in ETH, and he's running robotics center lab there, and he's also founder of uh, uh, any animal, right? animal, Anybody's. anybody, sorry, he's making that beautiful robot. We're going to see the performance today, probably in the talk. And uh, the, his team actually won the uh, DARPA Robotics Challenge, Subterranean Challenge last year. Got two million dollars. Uh, yeah, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, yeah. He seems a leading, like doing, doing like world leading, uh, the Lego commercial control, also in the uh, model based control and machine learning. Machine learning side is something I never seen before. So I will think, uh, I'd love to just uh, let him just talk his awesome stuff. So, so give a hand to give a start. Working. So as Sammy mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the field of quantum field of motion, not only about this, but how to bring in general robots into the world. This is the motivation that I was trying to bring to front in, in these presentations. We want to make machines that can work in these kinds of conditions. And the big challenge for me are how do we make them mobile, how do we make them able to interact in uncertain and what we're very proud of is that we're not only talking about these things, but we're really sending the robots to all these environments. We have lots of search and rescue applications, lots of applications that are underground, mines 1,000 meter underground, in offshore, and hopefully at some point also in space. We're not quite there yet. In terms of the research that is happening in my group, we are designing new robots from scratch that starts with actuators and sensors and goes into full robotics. We work a lot on model-based planning and control, in particular on uh, model predictive control in that sense. Then we started about four or five years ago um, with reinforcement learning, using that for locomotion control and now expanding a little bit more towards uh, autonomy and navigation. And then the last element is about perception, about using multimodal perception in order to make the system autonomous and navigate in all kinds of challenging environments. You see here a number of different platforms that we're working with. I'm going to focus in my talk mostly on legged systems, but we're applying this a lot to construction robotics, agriculture machines. We do uh, work in sustainability projects. This is about a cleaning machine that is on the river collecting uh, river trash. We work in uh, rehabilitation devices together with people from the health science department. Now, legged systems have always been um, my main passion. I started that with my PhD about uh, a decade ago. At the beginning, it was all pure research. Uh, some of you might uh, recall um, Starlet back then, but we did some of the first dynamic gates. We then continued and went on developing machines that could go for the first time outside, do start with field robotics. And now, since 2016, when we had the company, we really worked towards industrializing that having a system that is fully certified as a product, working in all kinds of harsh conditions, predominantly from a company perspective, working on industrial inspection. And I'm going to show a couple of examples at the very end. This is Animal D, the latest generation that we released uh, last November. Now, a lot of that involves designing these robots, making them reliable, high performant. We have to do deal with all kinds of EMI issues. We want to make them uh, very rugged. They are IP67, so we can wo uh, walk into the water for one hour. We have now an ATEX version that allows us to operate in explosive environments, and that really opens up all these opportunities to go uh, to challenging environments. Now, in this seminar, I don't want to focus too much on the hardware side, but much more on how do we control them, how do we make them uh, autonomously navigate our environments. I think one thing that we, as a community, all agreed is that we need some sort of a torque or impedance controllable machine uh, in order to make them move around. Pure position control, probably not work. Uh, then we have many different elements that come together, starting from a navigation algorithm that somehow tells the robot where to walk through. Then you have some motion planners that in the local proximity of the environment tells the robot, look, where to step, when to step, how to move around uh, an obstacle. You then have a controller that somehow tries to track that as well as possible, some sort of a whole body controller. And then you have joint level control. 
Then there's a lot of feedback that is happening. One feedback loop is the purely proprioceptive feedback loop, so looking at the internal measurements that you can do. And the other one is an extraceptive feedback loop where you look at cameras, lidars, in order to localize and map uh, the environment. And many of these modules are understood and researched about in the context of mo mobile robotics, but we really try to squeeze them together and make this much more performant for in the context of legged systems. Predominantly, these two parts, I would say today, is very well understood. The biggest challenges are up here. So we're continuously moving to the left, in my eyes, in terms of where the research, the hard research question lie. When I was here last time uh, talking about legged systems, how we control that, structures look like this. So we are breaking up even the control problem and the planning problem quite a bit into underlying modules. Somebody who tells you how to move, they have some gate selector, then you have some foothold optimization ongoing, some support polygons that you optimize for. You figure out what is the motion that I have to do using simplified models and some optimization running there, and then some tracking control underneath. Today, I would say like the state-of-the-art algorithms in this field, they're able to solve this as an MPC uh, problem. So we're optimizing over the complete way of where to step, partially even when to step, and how to move. And the big challenges are in how do we increase model complexity. Today we are getting close to the full body dynamics, centroidal dynamics. Maybe for some aspects we're only looking at this single rigid body dynamics, which has a little bit of an assumption that the legs are quite lightweight, don't cause too much influence on the main body motion. But that's pretty much the area where people are operating. If you're looking at these algorithms and how we're deploying them on the actual machine, this can get to a level, as we can see in this video here. So we have the robot getting across some of the obstacles. We're looking permanently at the environment, mapping the environment, feeding this back into our MPC controller. And I'll show you later in how we're exactly doing this. And we can get across all kinds of different uh, obstacles. Pretty challenging one, ones, I would say. Now, how do we do that? Point number one is that we have to figure out how we model the whole robot, what kind of elements that we're looking at. We are running these days mostly optimization algorithms uh, in joint space that allow us to uh, like account for the complete, the whole body uh, motion in it, where we can do collision avoidance, also knee hitting issues and stuff like that. So we're not only optimizing for the footholds, but we're looking at how the complete system is moving. In that, we're trying to track certain uh, task space references. One very important element that we're very often looking at is uh, this frequency shaping. So we want to have cost functions that punish high frequency motions, high frequency force changes, such that we have in the end a behavior that is really deployable on a machine that has even an imperfect uh, actuator. And then we can include all kinds of uh, constraints velocity limit, torque limits, friction cones, and whatever in one optimization loop. Now, what is also important is how do we include perception in that? And I think there's two ways in how we can do this, uh, or how we're doing it today. The first way is that we're looking at this as a constraint. So we are segmenting the environment. We find in this environment certain patches where we can potentially step on, and we use this in our optimization as a content constraint. The second way is that we are generating an environment where somehow kind of with all in painting and uh, some smoothing out, we're creating a complete elevation map of that and we do some filtering. And once you have a smoothened out environment representation, we can really use that also to calculate the gradients and to directly uh, introduce that into our optimization problems. With this all together, we're generating an MPC framework that looks as follow. You have here asynchronously running to the rest of the optimization the whole mapping pipeline. So we're generating an elevation map, 2.5D. We're using that in order to do some classification, uh, pre-computation, segmentation. Then we're using that in our nonlinear MPC, generating the references and tracking that with our whole body controller while we get some state estimator and disturbance observer that we are feeding back into our MPC pipelines. Looking at the whole optimization uh, frequencies, we're getting to a level where this is really online, onboard, in real time, with a couple of hundred of hertz that we can run in this. 
So in short, this looks as follows. The robot moves across the environment. While doing so, we have here sensors on the robot itself that maps the environment. And in this map, we are figuring out what are these individual patches. And then we take these as convex uh, elements into our optimization pipeline. At the same time, we generate some signed distance fields that allow us to do obstacle avoidance, collision avoidance uh, in the optimization itself. And we have some completely filtered point clouds that allow us then to adapt the torso to the body um, according to like the global terrain, not only looking at individual patches where the robot uh, steps on. And with this at hand, we have a pipeline that really allows us to, in real time, do all kinds of dynamic maneuvers, even across pretty challenging uh, terrains. As you can see, this is stimulation, simulation at the time. Uh, we are not quite there yet that we can do this on the robot uh, on, in the experiment, in particular because perception is still one of the tricky elements that you can do this reliably and robust on the machine itself. But at least you get to a level uh, like this, a little less dynamic, but pretty decent obstacles that you have in your environments. I think that's pretty much state of the art in MPC control for quadrupedal locomotion across challenging environments. There's one big issue with that. And the big issue is that if you look at the real world outside, if you go to the wild, that this one is really full uh, of corner cases. I collected here a couple of them. So you have surfaces that might not be uh, uh, very solid, they move around, you might sink in, you might have slippery surfaces. And the assumption that you do in your uh, optimization pipelines that the contact only occurs at the feet, that the rain is static, this is just not valid in many cases. Now, how do you overcome that? What people most of the time do is that to overcome this, um, the, all these corner cases is that you do some online disturbance observer and then you react to that. You have some slip detection and some recovery reflexes. If you bump into something, you implement the height reflex to overcome that. Then you do some handcrafting for gait and heuristic uh, adaptation. So maybe stepping faster, reacting different to certain uh, conditions. You have some regaining contact reflexes, etc., etc. This is not really what we want to do in my eyes because that creates lots of handcrafted heuristics. The more complex the problem become, the more you have to handcraft them and the more you have to tune them. And it's really also unclear if you're looking down the road, what kind of sensor information do you have to do? What is the decisions that we have to take based on this sensor information in order to modify it here? So what we started to look at, uh, isn't there methods out there that would allow us to just make the robot identify this and learn this um, by itself? And that has started our whole development in reinforcement learning. So making, I don't have to explain reinforcement learning, I think everyone in this room knows how this works, but leveraging massive simulation, huge amount of data in order to train our agents. You see here an example of a recent publication uh, where we can simulate like uh, 4,000 robots in parallel. What we do is kind of a game-like increase in the challenges in your environment. So the better your robot becomes, the harder you make the environment, and so on and so forth. And there's different kinds of obstacles that we are uh, simulating here. You see some sort of a stair-step-like thing. You have here inclines. And if you train these robots, and that's actually after a few dozens of minutes, you're able to get across these types of challenging environments. It's all nice. You have now a great reinforcement learning based controller in simulation, and then you take it, you put it on your system, and that's how it looks like. And actually, it took us quite a while to figure out how we can overcome this issue. The big problem is that we have a, a pretty decent reality gap between what you're simulating and what the actual physical robot is in the real world. And if you're looking at this, most of the time, we are generating a controller. This controller produces some torque, and then we have multi-body dynamic simulation. But this is not how a real robot is. A real robot has, for example, an actuator in between that has bandwidth limitations and lots of other things, a lot of delay if you send a command. And it actually turns out to be pretty tricky to model this from first principles, because many of these elements are uh, hard to capture. So what we were doing here is that we went to the system and he said, let's learn this difference from experiments on the robot. So let's disturb the robot in all kinds of conditions, figure out what is the input output behavior. 
So we combine two elements. We combine something that is difficult to model and easy to learn with something that is easy to model and difficult to learn. And we integrated that in a reinforcement learning pipeline where we have on one side some stochastic rigid body dynamic simulation paired with this learned actuator dynamics and all of that in one reinforcement learning loop. And it turns out that the networks that you need both for the policy as well as for the actuator network, they're pretty simple. So it's just some MLPs, very shallow. And only the only way how we're integrating memory in this is through a history of what we're measuring in the environment. Yeah, Ross. Why do you think you needed it for the RL pipeline, but you didn't need this level of accuracy for the actuators in the, in the MPC pipeline? In the MPC pipeline, the way how we are overcoming this is that we're doing this frequency shaping. So we essentially make a state extension that we can have cost functions that cut off certain frequencies that we don't want. So we're making it more conservative in regimes where we know that our actuators will not be able to track. We try to punish this as much as possible. But I think also there, there would be a big gain if you're integrating something like this, and that could be a nice research project. Why you can't use those um, like frequency shaping punishing uh, heuristics with the RL system? Um, it could be possible. Uh, the reasons I we don't want to do this too much is because I think this is a framework that allows us to push everything to the limits, and I think that's one thing that we are suffering a lot in the classical control regime or control approaches. People use these control approaches in an area where we know that they are. Uh, like fulfilling the model assumptions that you're having, but you're not pushing the limits. And this really allows us to push the limits, to operate a motor at its saturation. And otherwise, you do not have a proper model for these kind of things. Now, if you put this now on the real system, uh, that's a demonstration where we have here the learning process in simulation. And then every 15 iterations, we make a policy update on the actual robot. And you see how this robot starts to learn to walk. We speed up a little bit here. But within three minutes, we are able to train the robot to move around. Now, obviously, every update after these 10 seconds there has a lot of uh, data collection in the background. So we're talking here about eight hours of for these 15 policy updates that we're taking of simulation data. And yeah, the robot becomes pretty reasonably fast, uh, quite agile and able to move around. So if you want to play around with these things, everything is open source. You can just download it and play around for yourself, both with the rising pipeline, which is a CPU-based simulation, and also in the RSL gym, we have now connections to the complete uh, NVIDIA Isaac sim uh, simulations that you have here. So after three minutes, the robot is able to walk around pretty robust. Now, this is all flat ground, right? At the beginning, I, I said, like, we want to go to different types of environment. But first, let me talk about how can we do different maneuvers. So think about you would not only walk around, but you would train different maneuvers, and you would also learn in how we're combining these maneuvers. If you do this, you get behaviors like that. So here, the robot falls over, reasons about that, figures out the way to get up and continues to operate. And it actually turns out that you can put the machine in an arbitrary configuration on the ground, and it will find a way to get up and continue to operate. So that shows you a little bit where this mobility will go. And also here, the robot really has to deal with contact situations that are very hard to reason about in a very classical manner. Now let's leave the lab, and let's go to these kind of uh, conditions, so the real world. Now the big challenge that we have here is that it's, we don't know how to simulate snow and gravel and stuff like that. And even if we could, I'm sure it would take a lot of time. And the second question is, we don't even know if we could perfectly simulate what is the important information that I need to sense from environment in order to adapt my controller. So what we did here is that we uh, borrowed some ideas, which were early used for um, driving, for called privileged training. So we first train a teacher policy. And this teacher policy has the R algorithm that trains this MLP. But now we give this information, which is privileged information, about anything that might be useful for you to move. It tells you what the elevation is around you, what kind of friction coefficients you have at these individual uh, areas, things that you're not really able to measure. And then you 
generate uh, using this MLP encoder the latent information that your controller is using. Now, in a second step, what you're doing here is that you're copying the controller and you want to imitate the same action, but instead of like measuring this from your privileged information, you take readings, sensor readings that you have about the environment. So you want to recover this information from experience uh, while moving. And we have a TCN network that generates the same latent information. Now, similar as before, we combine this with an adaptive curriculum. So the better the robot becomes, the harder we make uh, the environment. And you can see here again, like very few simple kinds of modifications that we have in terms of terrain. So stepping stones, elevation, stairs, and things like that. And the hypothesis is that the real world is somehow a combination of all of these different things together. And you see the robot moving across terrain it hasn't seen before at all. And it's becoming actually pretty robust and reliable. And you can take this and bring it to the mountains, walk through pretty much arbitrary terrain. After we had these controllers implemented, the robot did not fall anymore at all. And there's some very interesting things that are happening here under the hood. So here we have a whiteboard and we put soap on it and we let the robot walk over it. Now you can see the robot steps on it, slips, and adapts the behavior and continues to operate. Now what we do here is that we decode what the network internally has in this late or generates in this latent information, the estimated friction coefficient. And you see here at the beginning, the friction coefficient is pretty high. Once you're stepping for the first time on it, you have a rapid decrease of the estimated friction coefficient. Then you walk, you adapt your behavior, and then after you leave the slippery surface again, you slowly gain confidence, you increase the estimated friction coefficient, you walk normally again. I would claim it's very similar to what we're doing if we're walking in the winter. First time we're slipping, we're stiffening up, we're moving differently, and then we slowly come back to normal operation. Here, similar thing, we have the robot walking across the step. It's blind, huh? So we walk, we hit, and now the robot remembers that there was an obstacle, triggers this reflex and step across without us giving any heuristics that this should be done. And if you look again what is happening uh, in these networks, you see here how the robot interprets the environment and assumes the environment is. So we know that in direction of locomotion in front, we have certain uncertainty about the elevation. Now you're hitting something, so you're moving your assumption of where your environment uh, might be, and as soon as you're stepping on it again, you gain confidence again, you can adapt to it. And also if you're looking at the saliency map, so this kind of sensitivity of my current output based on uh, signals that I had earlier, so you see here that what I hit before still has an influence on how I'm moving right now. That's one thing of it. Now, obviously, if you want to walk across this step, you would want to use perception. It's much, much better than uh, just walking into it, bumping into it first. So what he said as a nice thing to do would be just like take the elevation that you're measuring of your environment and inject that into your neural network-based controller. You can do this. And actually it turns out to work okay-ish. So you see here in the lab, the robot walking across solid obstacles that you can see pretty well with your sensors. But once you take this and you take it to the real world, it just doesn't walk, work anymore. And the reason for this is that once you go to the real world, perception is just getting very bad. You have here tall grass, that where you see what you see as a geometric obstacle is not really what you're actually feeling. You're sliding and slipping. That means your elevation mapping is corrupted. So we had to find a way in how we get uh, across this. In fact, there's tons of different examples how perception is corrupted in the real world. Reflected surfaces, if you go through vegetation, right? I mean, what does that tell you, where to step? So we have to figure out the method how the robot can itself reason about this and become robust and reliable while moving. So we again took the same idea and approach that we did before. First, teacher policy training. And for the teacher policy, obviously we give it just the perfect height scan about the environment. We have still the privileged information from before and this proprioceptive sensing uh, to control the teacher policy. We do this in simulation, different kinds of uh, environments. You see here the points that we're sampling in the environment that the gift and the robot has information. And then in the second step, we are training a student policy where we have a belief encoder with a recurrent neural network and some attention mechanism that tries to identify to what extent we can trust our perception and to what extent we should trust our proprioceptive uh, sensing. 
not going to go too much into detail, but show you this, uh, how this looks like on the actual system. So here you have foam. You see how the representation looks like and how you see it, but then how you estimated it in blue. Here you see something where the robot doesn't see the obstacle, and as soon as we're stepping on it, the assumption is adapted to what you're feeling, and you use that in order to further plan. You can walk across stairs and steps using perception. This is very agile. And then you can also blindfold the robot, and it will still be able to do it. You see here the uh, Takahiro, the PhD student who uh, did this uh, type of work. So blindfolding the robot. You see then how the robot perceives the environment. Essentially, just sees noise or no information about that. But as soon as we are stepping on something, we change the hypothesis of how the environment uh, is in our environment, uh, is in front of us, and adapt that. So we can still get across stairs, not as gentle anymore as before, but we get across it. Then we're taking this, we put it on the, the actual system. How that looks like is that we have the perception sensors in the front and the back of the robot. We use that in order to generate elevation maps of the environment, take this height scan. So we, in this elevation map, we sample the points and we use that in our student policy in order to make the system move. And that's the video that maybe some of you have seen, which we recently uh, released, where we get across all kinds of different nasty terrain, where we have sliding and slipping conditions, where we have grass in the nature, going through snow. So we tested this for uh, more than a year. We also took the robot um, to underground areas. This is preparation experiments that we're doing for the DARPA sub -t challenge. We also made a, a hike with it, and that should come in a minute. So we did, last summer, we did a hike in, uh, in the Swiss mountains, where we took a hike which is classified as difficult for a human hiker. It takes the human hiker uh, 35 minutes uh, to go up as a, an official time, and we did it in exactly the same time with the robot. This is not autonomous in that sense, so we had a guy steering the robot, but still it shows a little bit, it was just a demonstration of the locomotion performance, getting across all kinds of different challenging terrains. This shows some of the most tricky terrains, sliding and slipping, uh, things that you can not really see well because it's reflective, and you see the level of robustness and reliability that we get here. You can literally not make the robot fall anymore. Um, let me skip this for the interest of time. Um, I had a couple of discussions with some students this morning. Uh, they asked me about space robotics. I'll show you a few elements of what we're doing in here. So this is uh, one of the robots that we're using for space applications. And if you go to space, very low gravity, and you want to make the system move in very low gravity, you want to make behaviors like this. Could you make this like turn like cats, make landing maneuvers like this? And we tried this for quite a while using uh, model-based approaches, and it turned out to be pretty, pretty difficult. So we took the exact same approach that we use now for locomotion um, with this robot. So we trained using PPO a neural network that allow us to generate the behavior for this machine in order to make it reorient uh, in space. And we took that robot then to ESA on their floating bed, and we had it jump around from left wall to right wall, forth and back. And it's actually interesting how robust it can handle also like situation where it lands with two legs, one leg. It's very nice. You can also start doing things like this in space, reorient in space, do landing maneuvers like that. I think that shows a little bit where this performance can go with these type of vehicles. Now in our group, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're not work only working on non-legged system. We try to take these approaches and apply them to all kinds of different machines. One extension that we were doing with uh, our legged systems was to extend it with wheels in order to make them faster and efficient while keeping the mobility of legged systems. So we took the same infrastructure for training them to move around. You see here on the right-hand side this, but together with a digital realization, digital twin of, that's a physics building that we digitized uh, at ETH in, in Hönkeberg. And we have the robot being trained to move and to navigate in these types of environment. And on top of this, we started to do things like that. 
So can you make it stand up and move both in humanoid configuration and driving configuration, balance, uh, and these kind of things? And it's interestingly robust in how you can do this. Uh, using the exact same reinforcement learning pipeline uh, I've shown you before. We get across, we can drive across uh, certain obstacles with that. And I think that allows us also to address new challenges, new ideas in where to apply these machines and what to do with these kinds of machines. Now, so far I was only talking about controls, not really about autonomy. And that's the second part that we are looking at quite frequently in our group. How can we make this system uh, now autonomously navigate their environment. We have different perception sensors, so most of the time you're using a LiDAR sensor on top for SLAM, for uh, localizing the robot, for mapping the environment. We then have stereo cameras and LiDARs in front uh, and back of the robot in order to perceive the ground. I don't want to dive too much into detail, but we have a complementary SLAM pipeline developed, in particular in the context of the DARPA's subterranean challenge that uses different types of sensor modality checks for their health and condition in order to have a very robust localization and mapping of the environment. And then for the local terrain that we use for foothold planning, local navigation, we do a GPU-based elevation mapping. So we're taking the sensory streams on the GPU, uh, do some, some prepara data preparation of that, and uh, drift compensation and get like elevation maps, as you can see it here, which we then use for the local uh, photo planning. So that's uh, the three types of environments that we're looking at. So full 3D point clouds as a 3D reconstruction of the environment, a volumetric reconstruction that we use for free space identification, navigation planning, and then the local 2.5D map in order to have uh, photo planning and obstacle crossing. We took this system and we brought it to the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, which included three types of environments, tunnel system, urban system, and cave networks. And it kind of combined all kinds of different challenges that we're facing in the real world. Unstructured and unknown environments at various different scales, so that's a mapping problem. You have this rough and hardly traversable terrain. You have degraded perception, which you have to account for also in the control, no communication or nothing. DARPA did not specify what robots to take. So what we did was assemble a very heterogeneous team. We have quadrupeds, different kinds of drones, wheeled vehicles. But what was interesting in the finals at the very end, we really only deployed legged systems. So how this looks like is that we took these machines, we brought them underground. There was one guy who could operate the machines. We had 15 minutes of time to bring the machines on stage, and then that person had to do the full operations of this fleet of robots. There's one gate, you have no clue what is behind, and you have to send the robots into that uh, environment. They have to autonomously explore, so they go into this environment, they have to explore, figure out what directions they can go and what not, map the environment, and search for artifacts in this environment. You have challenging terrain, you have, uh, they rebuilt the metro station uh, on the ground, with stairs and steps. And if it just was not enough, they also put like smoke traps and things like that, that the robot had to handle. Uh, make sure that you're not like freaking out because perception all of a sudden uh, is not that perfect anymore. Now, how does the robot see the environment? We have it moving around. This is uh, somewhere in a storage space that was underground. And you have now two planners that you see in yellow. This is the global planner. We're looking at free space in our environment. So what are the areas where we can gain most new information? And then we're looking with the local planner, what is traversable and not, not, what not, and how can we move through our environment, uh, navigate around obstacles. We then have these four image streams that you see here on bottom, where we're looking at the environment, identify objects, 3D localize them, and then when the robot comes back, it can hand over this whole map and tell, look, this backpack was at that location, and uh, do this with pretty high precision. For the a uh, high-level global navigator or exploration planner, what we're doing is we're building up a graph while moving around. We look what is the biggest space where I can gain new information. If there's multiple solutions, we keep this in a, in a graph. Uh, once we are out of time, for example, if you tell the robot 15 minutes, you should explore, then you go back and uh, come to the node where you had the last time your communication. The bigger challenge for us as legacy systems is how do we solve local navigation? Where do we, how do we identify where to walk through? And if you look at this from a classical approach, 
uh, we did again like lots of handcrafting of looking at the environment and obviously don't want to go across slopes, steps, roughness is also bad. So we uh, kind of converting an elevation map into a cost map and use that for planning. Now, we humans, we are extremely good in guiding the robot. Obviously, we can look at the environment and tell it what is good or bad. So we did in a second approach. We said, why don't we just hand label a couple of environments and say, look, here you can walk and here not. And it turns out that this is actually pretty efficient. So you can uh, hand label a couple of data sets and then use that in order to learn this. However, this does not really include what is the actual locomotion performance of the system. So what we were then working on is an approach that says, well, why don't we train this again through simulation? Obviously, we must be able to look at the terrain patch around the robot and from that identify certain local features that together with the direction tells us, look, this is how much energy you need. This is the risk of failure. Uh, this is the time that you need to move from A to B. And if you have now our controller implemented in simulation, we can figure out what these cost predictors and the local feature tracks are by just purely training it in simulation. Once you have it, you then just deploy it that you take the map of your environment. You have certain commands, so like if I want to go right or left, uh, like ask your network to tell you what is the cost and optimize uh, over it. You can then do some smoothening out. If you put this again into like a nice visualization, that's how it looks like thousands of robots that move through the environment in all kinds of different directions, identifying the environment where it can go. And we can even do this now in the meanwhile using uh, 3D representations or occupancy maps. And you see here a little bit how these cost functions look like. So it's actually pretty reasonable. You don't want to go across, uh, close the border. You don't want to go across steps and slopes and roughness and things like that. But this is purely inferred uh, by the simulation itself. Now that's how we do it today. It looks uh, as follows. We then take this cost function and we plan on top of this using uh, two things, using, uh, looking at where do we interact with the environment. These are the red footholds here. And how should the base move through, so without colliding. Parts that collide with the environment make contact on only nice surfaces and parts that do not collide with the environment. And that's how it looks like. So you see the 2.5D representation of the environment, a new waypoint, the robot itself uses, uh, in that case, it's a lazy PRM method where we can, in the background, permanently like explore for different directions. When we call a new point, the robot can immediately find the way to move there. And that's the way how we were crossing all kinds of different challenging terrains. In this DARPA competition, you see here two cases. On the right-hand side is the robot navigating through narrow environment. On the left-hand side, this is when we go to the metro station. The problem is at the metro station, you have lots of free space down there. So you want the global planner always wants to kill the robot and send it down to gain most information. So the local planner has to tell you, no, this is not the right way to go. And then we replan. And that actually worked, worked pretty well. So we had no failures that it was jumping down or do things like that. Now, this is a hierarchical structure. And that's the way how we used to break up these problems so far. Now, let me tell you a little bit on how this will continue in the future. So what we do here is that we have first a target position. Then we have this path planner that tells us where to go. Then you have some path follower. And then you track this using your locomotion controller. If you look at the MPC frameworks we had at the beginning, all of that was kind of one thing. So we borrowed this idea. And we translated this also for the reinforcement learning pipeline and said, like, let's just give the robot the waypoint and let it go there. We don't tell it how to move, that it moves with constant velocity or whatever. And it turns out that this really allows us to do new maneuvers, things we will not be able to do. Think about crossing this gap. If you do this with constant velocity, it will not work. But if you tell the robot, just be there in five seconds, do whatever you like to go there, then all of a sudden we can like, speed up, make a jump, and go there. Um, and that shows a little bit in simulation what is possible with this. So we can do multi-contact, high dynamic maneuvers where the um, the system has to trigger really maneuvers that we were not able to do before. It's also interesting in how the robot starts to move all of a sudden. That's how it looks like. So here we just give it the waypoint and tell it go there and use as little energy as possible. It starts to run like a crap. It doesn't do this classical trotting anymore. And it's, it actually is more efficient. And the reason for that is probably how we have the motors arranged in our system. So we have two hip motors which are 
almost equally strong, so the most efficient way is to move diagonal. And that's kind of things that we are suddenly seeing also in the actual system. And I think this has quite a bit of potential in how we're moving uh, forward down the road, that we are not handcrafting anymore the way how it's supposed to be moving, but really just giving waypoints and this local navigation and control is coming together. Now with this all together, we, and this coming back again to the DARPA competition, so we had four robots that were all starting in the same starting location, going into four different uh, areas, collecting a 3D map. So these are multiple kilometers of distance in total. You see here underneath, this was generated by, the hu by humans with the Leica total station going through the environment. 100 hours for the humans to collect the map of this complete underground site. The robots did it in one hour. And the precision is, uh, is pretty close to what we achieved there. Now, what I really liked in this competition um, was that the top six teams, they all built upon legged robots. And DARPA did not say, like, use legged robots. But I think it's interesting to see that if it's about challenging environments, making systems highly mobile to cross this kind of uh, situations, that we are kind of starting to believe in legged robots to be the, the right approach. So if I would conclude this talk, I, this, they had a poster there. This was shot during the DARPA competition. I think the, the future is legged robots, and actually it's already now. Um, I want to show you in the last five minutes just a little bit in how we're applying this today for real world applications, also in a commercial context. So it's not only about interesting research that you can do underground exploration, but really having these robots going through industrial plants to do fully autom automated uh, industrial inspection. There's two ways in how we're deploying these robots. The first way is if you don't know about the site, what you do is you take the robot and you guide it around, tell it where to go through, it collects a map, and you get an understanding of the environment, and then you can let the robot replay this. So you can do full inspection missions like that. Now with more modern plants, typically you have a digital twin of that plant already, so we can plan the inspection mission purely in the digital world, and then have the robot on the real site localizing with respect to the digital twin and execute uh, this inspection task. The robot itself is equipped with a pan tilt hat, uh, with a uh, no, normal RGB zoom camera, thermal camera, acoustic sensors, light, and whatever you need for that. And you do these three types of inspection tasks, so thermal inspection, acoustic inspection, and pure visual inspection. Let me show you how this looks like. So visual inspection is like you know more or less where these pressure meters are. You go there, I want to read the time, I zoom in, and then, then I interpret. So we don't want to send raw data, but what we really want to do is like we tell the operator, look, this is 0.5 bars, and we record this. You can do thermal inspection, thermal 3D mapping. If that motor that I saw yesterday is suddenly like five degrees hotter today, I might have an issue, so we can do all this predictive maintenance. Similar, we can do things with acoustic inspection, so finding gas leaks, listening to roller bearings. If a roller bearing sounds weird, you have an early onset of a failure, and you can do predictive maintenance tasks. 3D geometric observations, in particular on construction side, to uh, figure out what is the build status at the moment. And here is like two examples uh, how we're deploying them. This is at BASF in Ludwigshafen. That's a huge chemical plant. And you see the robot navigating around. Some of them have these acoustic sensors on top that they can do also full triangulations of gas leaks. So we also locate them. You see that the mission is planned in a 3D, uh, in a digital twin. So we give the robot the waypoints, where to navigate through. We have also the inspection points to find the digital twin. And then we take the robot, localizing with respect to the digital twin while being operating on the real site, avoiding obstacles and do things like that, and then doing this multi-floor inspection task. On the right-hand side, this is on an offshore site uh, in uh, Malaysia, where we have the robot on an old site. There's no digital twin of that, so we guide it around first. And then you have the robot uh, localizing with respect to these pre-recorded maps. So this is this I'm at the end of the, my presentation. I don't know if you have still time. If yes, I can go for five more sure. four minutes. Yeah. Otherwise, we can. OK. So the, the last time, how much time? Five minutes, 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Ten minutes. All right, good. 
So let's switch gears a little bit about something that I'm really excited. This is the biggest walking robot we have uh, in my group. It's 12 tons heavy. Um, for those of you who have worked with hydraulic system at some point, they know that this is very tricky to control this hydraulic. So our first step was, let's make this to become a robot. That means we swapped hydraulics, we added sensors. It's OK, you can do this, but this doesn't make it scalable. So what we did very recently is like, let's borrow these ideas of what we did with the actuator model learning and deploy this on these large scale machines. So if you look at the hydraulics, the hydraulics have multiple stages. They have very complex cylinder geometries and linkage uh, systems. You have one pump, one motor, and dozens of uh, cylinders that you have to somehow control. Huge reach, it's not made for high precision. But what we are interested in the very end is simply if I move my joystick, what does my end effector do? So the question was, couldn't we just like model this from data? And then once you have modeled this, use that model in order to train a controller. So we go on the actual system and uh, we say, look, if this is your field of operation. Move around for a couple of hours, collect that data, then bring it back to your simulator and then train in the simulation a controller that allows us to very precisely move our end effectors to do some grading tasks, to do some digging tasks, where even like have situations where there's things in the dirt, you have to react to that, stuff that is very, very hard to model. And it turns out that you can do pretty precise end effector motion both in Earth and, and uh, in the air. So you can start constructing complex stuff. So that's collaborations we do with architects. Let's make an arbitrary freeform shaped nice surface, give it the robot and let the robot execute it. And we can actually do this uh, like two, three centimeters precision. And the nice thing is also that on the fly, we can adapt to what is happening, which means you can start building material neutral. So we tell the robot what it's supposed to be look like. Certain dimensions might not be that important, but while observing, knowing how much material is there, you can continuously adapt the plan and you can say, okay, let's build this without removing earth or bringing more earth to the site. You can grasp objects, we can start looking at them. We have the whole mapping pipeline. So we can measure the different geometric properties of that. And if you have that, you can actually start optimizing building walls. How do we assemble these things? Uh, you can even think of like structure walls that you say, look, we want to have this amount of force that you want to hold with that wall and build it up and then have the robot build this. This is like one of the most challenging tasks for a human excavator driver. It takes them many years until they're able to do this. We are not yet at the same speed, but in terms of the fill factor that we achieve with the wall, uh, this is performance-wise even better than what a human uh, can do. So you can build these walls here. Um, we did this two years ago, and now last summer we had a construction site for three months. This is 1,000 stones roughly, 10 meters tall, 80 meters long, some nice earthwork on the side, like all built fully in autonomous fashion. Here's another cool example. Think about this guy. And now what you want to do is like make some fancy stuff with it. It's very hard to model it, and the manufacturer won't tell you what kind of hydraulic circuits you have in there. So what are we doing? We take the machine, we drive it forth and back, and we figure out what happens if I drive forth and back, and then we generate the model out of it, we bring it to the simulation, and then we let it do like this. Yeah. Yes, it was like for the first tip overs was safety. Yeah. There's some drivers that can do this, but you have to be a very skilled driver to do this. All right. So that's the last fun I have to show today. So we did some stopping. Thanks a lot.